Let me just sketch these. If you've never marked them in your Bible, you can. If you have already done this, just kind of reinforce this and think about it. But what we see here is, first of all, the church at Ephesus, that's the first seven verses, we can call the Ephesian period. And this is the period from when the church was born at Pentecost through the end of the relative peace the church existed. We call this the Ephesian period. It was a period of warmth, of love, of labor for Christ from the apostles until the defection and the cooling of the love of some. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, by the time we get to the book of Jude, just back up for a second and look at this, we find in the 60s AD, Jude is writing, look what he writes in in this book. Verse 3, beloved of Jude, I was diligent to write unto you concerning our common salvation, but I found it necessary to write unto you to exhort you to contend earnestly for the faith which was delivered. Already in the apostolic period, people were cooling off and, and leaving the church, defecting. The Ephesian period then talks about the gradual cooling of the fervor of the church, the entrance of the false professors, of uh, false possessors. They don't even possess Christ. They profess to, but they don't know him, that Jesus warned of. And we find even, if you look at uh, uh, 3 John, he talks about, uh, look at 3 John, that's just before Jude, verse 9, the diatrophies. Uh, and he says there that, that he loves to have the preeminence in, in 3 John verse 9. We find the beginning of the problem of, of people wanting to be preeminent and wanting to be lording over churches and wanting to be little dictators and wanting to be the masters over the church instead of Christ's servants. And that's the Ephesian period. It's a 30-year period of time where the church went from the, the absolute purity of Pentecost, where church discipline, where Ananias and Sapphira's of the day were dead on the spot, to the point where we have diatrophies who are lording over churches and wolves coming in that Paul warned about and those false, false professors of Christianity that Jesus warned of. Well, that period goes into, starting in verse 8, the second layer of church or era of church history, the persecuted church. And this is called the Smyrna period. It's the church of Smyrna. And this goes basically, the time of persecution starts pretty heavily in the time of Nero in 60 AD, and it continues all the way through until the times of the 300s AD. And the Smyrna period was an era of martyrdom. And if you remember, the church in Smyrna, there's no criticism because usually when the church is being persecuted, there's a lot of purity. I think that in America, when our bubble bursts and we don't have all these freedoms and we don't have all the money just kind of gushing and we can buy and have and go and do anything we want, I think we'll see not only economic retreat, but we'll also see spiritual retreat in America. You know what goes on in in the communist countries? Do you know what went on? If your family was an ardent, church-going, Christ-honoring family, your children could not go to the universities. They couldn't go. They couldn't get a higher education. They were consigned to being bricklayers and garbage truck uh, runners in, in the communist system for the rest of their life. They could never get educated. They couldn't do any of those things. Now, in America, bricklayers are highly paid and garbage truck operators are in unions and you know they make more than, than teachers make. But in the communist system, it was the lowest strata of society. And if you followed Christ, your children could not go to school. Well, you know what people did? They made a choice whether they're going to follow Christ or not. That's what happens here. And this time of, of martyrdom, the church was a sweet savor to God of faithfulness unto death, but there was a further development of people defecting from the faith. In fact, a lot of people, if you remember the Libelli controversy, was you would get this little slip of paper annually. It's kind of like our safety inspections you know, we have here in... in uh, Oklahoma, and you get this little sticker on your car, and, and it runs out, and everybody reminds you when it's run out. I remember when I first moved here, I didn't even know what it was. And, and uh, one of the dear deacons came up to me, and he says, did you know that your sticker is overdue? I said, I didn't know I had a sticker. He says, you do, and it's overdue. And I said, oh, what do I do? And so he kind of herded me through the process. And a year later, he came to me and said, it's overdue again. That was neglect. The other time was lack of knowledge. But what we find is that, that the Christians back then would go and, and bow to the image of Caesar in order to not get persecuted, they give them a little credit card that said they were okay for another year. And people were actually defecting from Christ to get their little libelli, their, their little certificate that said that they wouldn't be persecuted by the Roman government. And when they would come to church, they'd say, wait a minute, didn't you bow to Caesar? You can't come to church. And so there was this whole problem of the people who had defected and then they come back. And also, there was the simplicity of the early church was totally lost in those centuries because they started... 
adding all these other layers of stuff, and, and it wasn't any of it wrong. It was just they, were, they forgot the simplicity that was in Christ, and they started making all these rules, like, like you could come to church for a year before you took part in communion, and then after you uh, were baptized, then you had to wait another so many months till you could do this and that, and they made all these rules that started being just protection to keep people from defecting, but the rules became enshrined, and pretty soon only the pastors had the power to lead in communion. And so the people could never lead in the Lord's table. Do you remember in the first, when the church first started, what went on? They went from house to house sharing the Lord's table. But it became centralized. And, and, and only if you were in this certain order could you be baptized. And there were all of these rules that developed. And that's the Smyrna period. And if you look, starting in verse 12, this is the compromising church. Uh, starting in verse 12 down to 17 is the Pergamite period of church history. This is basically from 300 to 500 A.D. And the true faith of Christ more and more disappeared from view. And the clericalism, that's religious uh, clerics that, that wore these robes and did all this stuff, began to ascend. And in the Pergamite period, formalism, worldliness, and the church of Revelation 17, the church, the false harlot church, began to emerge. And we'll look at that specifically. The next period, if, if you're a Bible marker, is the corrupt church of chapter uh, 2, verse 18. That's the Thyatiran period. That shows basically what went on from uh, the year 500 A.D. to the time of the Reformation, 1500 A.D. This is the age of purple and glory, a corrupt priesthood, the darkness, truth was almost hidden. The effeminacy and clerical domination, if you look at any of the paintings from this period, you look at Jesus, and he just looks like a wimp in those pictures. I mean, he's very effeminate and kind of pale and walking around. And that's kind of what the church was like in that period of time, those thousand years. We call those the Dark Ages. And the church usurped the place of Christ and the witness of Jesus. Uh, those who witnessed to him were given dungeons and stakes and inquisitions and the enthronement of false prophets during this time. And that ended... To the day, in the days of Luther and the Reformation. Next, in, in if you're uh, charting this in your Bible, starting in chapter 3, verse 1, this is the Sardian period. Uh, not Sardines, uh, Sardian, as in Sardius, the church of Sardis. And that goes from about after the Reformation till about the beginning of the 19th century. And that's the age of the, the uh, worthy names marked by, by, you know, kind of the state churches. They, they were preaching the gospel, but they they just kind of were cold, and, and it wasn't a real passionate time. It was kind of the time when, when the churches returned to the teaching of the gospel, but they didn't have the fervor and the love and sometimes weren't careful with doctrine. In the Sardian period uh, is the lethargy of the Protestant centuries before what we saw happen starting in the 19th century, and that's the Philadelphian period, and that starts in verse 7. Of chapter 3. And the Philadelphian period is a period from about 1800 to the mid uh, 1950s or so. It's a time of great missionary fervor, great evangelistic outreach, great devotion to godliness. The world was penetrated with the gospel like no time since the first century. In fact, from, from the beginning of Christian missions, from the time of Adoniram Judson and the time of William Carey and the time of, of Henry Martin, when Every part of the world, there was no part that was not blanketed with the gospel. There was no portion of, of islands. There was no uh, remote people that someone did not give their lives. For example, in the 1820s, in the part of Africa where, where Liberia is today, over its western Africa, in the center there, right in the coastal area, missionaries went there, and the one missionary, the pioneer missionary that went, took eight couples with him, and he wrote back to London, and he said this, you will hear within a few weeks that there is death in our midst. He says, if you hear of any of our missionaries dying, send another couple to take their place. And before three or four months were over, the first couple died. Before six months, the second couple. Before the first year, half of them had died of malaria. And before ten years were passed, the leader himself had succumbed. But you know what happened? The churches kept sending more people. And more kept going until Africa was penetrated from coast to coast with the gospel. That's the Philadelphian period in church history. But then the Laodicean period starts in verse 14. And we know that it was a time of great religious compromise. And the church became lukewarm, self-sufficient, empty, a false peace, which we have settled into today. 
It's kind of like that, that we're going to save the world. We are going to uh, reform society. And we're going to do it by joining hands with everyone. And basically, that's why there's so much confusion now. I mean, we believe abortion's wrong. I'm personally very, very much committed to, to believing abortion's wrong. But I will not compromise the message of Christ to stand along someone that thinks Jesus Christ is merely an angel. And, and have anybody confused with thinking that, that I, with that Mormon, uh, agree on anything other than decency and morality, but not theologically, but it's very hard to do anything nowadays without compromising the gospel message. And that's the period we live in. And that's the lukewarm Laodicean period. <laughs> 